But we're going to start on Earth here in the UK and the political chaos facing the government there following the resignation of Prime Minister Liz Truss. Truss stepped down yesterday after a disastrous few weeks of financial turmoil and cabinet resignations. By the way, just 45 days into her tenure. The race to succeed Truss as leader of the Conservative Party and become Prime Minister is already underway. Truss's former leadership rival, Rishi Sunak, is among the favorites. But speculation is mounting over the possible return of Truss's predecessor, Boris Johnson. The winner could be announced as early as Monday or at the latest next Friday. That's right. And joining us now to talk more on this is Dr. Leslie Vinjamuri. She's the director of the U.S. and the Americas program and dean of the Queen Elizabeth II Academy for Leadership and International Affairs at Chatham House. Doctor, thank you so much for being with us this morning. So to jump in, Britain's Conservative Party is facing a second leadership contest in only just a few months, as we just heard some of the potential hopefuls actually include Boris Johnson, who stood down himself after a series of scandals. So just simply real talk does he actually have a chance and how unprecedented of a move would a, would that be it would be very unusual he certainly has a chance i think that uh, many people are hoping that that chance is quite small boris johnson will be working very hard to see if he can get the 100 <clears throat> votes of support that he needs from his fellow mps in order to make that cut that's a very high bar I think if he did come back, it would prove to be tremendously divisive. This is certainly uh, Boris Johnson, the most divisive candidate uh, possible when it comes to the party and the MPs who sit uh, in the House of Commons. Um, it's not impossible. I don't think he's favored right now, but he will be working very hard um, over the weekend to try and shore up support. And, Doctor, the opposition parties in the U.K. have been calling for a general election. And we want to show you right now a recent poll. Conservatives have been plummeting. This recent one by people polling shows them as low as 14 percent. So is the party at risk of appearing undemocratic by, again, choosing the next leader among their own? I think this is a real concern. You know, what, and the, the broader question is, will the next prime minister um, who's going to be chosen potentially only by the members of parliament. Remember, if only one candidate uh, manages to get those 100 uh, votes of support from his or her own MPs, that person will become prime minister on Monday. If there are two, it will go to an, a vote by the members of the Conservative Party. That's still a tiny number. Remember that uh, the Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who is stepping down soon, only won with 81,000 votes. So there is a real question about, you know, whether the next prime minister will be seen to be legitimate. This is the way that prime ministers are chosen in the UK. They're chosen by the party and people vote for their members of parliament, their local members of parliament to, to turn up in London. Uh, but when you have this kind of turn turnover, uh, this level of chaos, it raises a broader question, a constitutional question mm. about those rules, no, no matter how long standing they are. And Dr. Vindamuri, I wonder, beyond the UK, is this prolonged political instability damaging the UK's standing on the world stage? How is it impacting relations with allies like in Europe and the US? Well, we've seen uh, the, the leader of France, Macron, calling on the UK to, to generate more political stability. The European Union wants this. Um, everybody is watching Britain. I think we all know that it's sort of become the joke of the day, what's happening in the UK. Um, it's tremendously damaging here in the UK financially. People are deeply worried, first and foremost, about the impact on their daily lives, on the financial health, the economic health of the country. Um, at a time when we know the foreign policy issues are very significant, the UK should be and has been a leader um, when it comes to the response to the war in Ukraine, to questions of China. But all of those things right now are, you know, they're on hold until there is until we get through this period. So it's potentially tremendously damaging, certainly in the short term. And it really comes down to whether or not the party can choose a leader swiftly who can really uh, begin to bring the country back together and really tackle that very significant economic crisis that is that is looming large. For sure, a lot to watch out for. Dr. Leslie Vinjamuri, thank you so much. Switching gears to politics here in the U.S., the midterm elections are now just a little more than two weeks away, but already millions of Americans have cast their ballots in more than a dozen states. Tomorrow, early voting gets underway in both Massachusetts and Nevada, with more states to follow next week. 
And in Georgia, where early voting began this week, more than half a million voters have already cast their ballots in person. There are plenty of races we're watching as we get closer to the election, including for the Georgia Senate seat that could potentially decide which party controls Congress. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joins us now from Atlanta with the latest on that race. Ellison, good morning. Good to see you. You've been watching this one really closely. And Democrat Senate candidate, uh, current Senator Raphael Warnock and Republican challenger Herschel Walker are pretty much neck and neck. Just a few more days to go. We know that the Warnock campaign has released some new ads. What are those about? Yeah, so it's really interesting because Republican Herschel Walker, his personal life has been under heavy scrutiny throughout this campaign, right? There was that allegation that he paid for and encouraged the mother of one of his children to have an abortion, a claim that he adamantly denies. There have also been accusations of past domestic abuse. He has admitted to having violent tendencies in the past, but says that was due to his mental health struggles, uh, his struggles with disassociative identity disorder. He says he's not receiving treatment for that now, but he says he no longer has symptoms, and that is in his past. We have seen attack ads focused on Walker's personal controversies throughout this campaign cycle, but they have typically been from groups other than Warnock's campaign, from outside organizations. When Senator Warnock is on the campaign trail, the incumbent Democrat, he tends to focus on work that he has done in Washington, D.C. He talks a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act, things like that. He doesn't really get into the details about some of the allegations against her Walker. He will say that he believes he is a candidate who is unqualified for the United States Senate. And he says that Herschel Walker has a pattern of lies, but rarely goes beyond that. Today, that is changing. The Warnock campaign has two new ads out in this market, both of them hitting Walker for those abortion allegations. Again, claims that Walker denies and also his history of violence. Listen to some of one of those ads that's now on air. For you, Herschel Walker wants to ban abortion. There is no exception in my mind. I can say I believe in life. There's not a national ban on abortion right now, and I think that's a problem. But for himself? Herschel Walker paid for an abortion for his then-girlfriend. She supported her claims. So this is, as you said, an incredibly tight race. In a lot of recent polls, the two are essentially in a statistical tie. So these new campaign ads from Warnock, it is a notable shift in their campaign tactics, especially when we're less than 20 days from the election. Well, and Elson, talking about that, can you give us some insight on what we're seeing from both candidates on the campaign trail in these final days? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yesterday we were out on the trail with Walker's campaign. Today we will be out with Warnock's campaign. Again, Warnock on the campaign trail, he tends to focus on the work that he has done in Washington, D.C., and trying to paint his opponent as unqualified. We tend to hear uh, Herschel Walker really try to hammer into his supporters to voters what he sees as Warnock's close ties to President Biden. President Biden has a low approval rating in this state. You often hear Walker say, Biden and Warnock, they are one in the same. And if you're worried about inflation, if you're worried about the cost of gas, they're the ones to blame. One thing that we've started to see in the last week or so Herschel Walker talk more about is trying to attack Warnock um, for uh, evictions related to a low income apartment building that the church that Warnock is a pastor at, Ebenezer Baptist, owns. Um, That Uh, that housing complex, a conservative outlet had an article about a week ago saying that residents there had been served eviction notices. Walker's campaign is really trying to aggressively focus on that. Warnock has not outright explicitly denied that, but he has called those attacks a smear uh, on his campaign by a desperate uh, candidate. Lindsay. All right, Ellison, we know you'll stay on top of it. Thanks so much. And now we turn to the Supreme Court. SCOTUS has denied a request to block the Biden administration's student loan forgiveness program. The case was rejected by Justice Amy Coney Barrett yesterday, one day after a Wisconsin taxpayers group argued forgiving loans should be passed by Congress. Earlier this week, the Biden administration began accepting applications from borrowers who can have as much as $20,000 in federal loans forgiven. And former Trump advisor Steve Bannon is scheduled to be sentenced today for his contempt of Congress conviction. It comes exactly one year after the House held him in contempt for failing to comply with a subpoena from the January 6th committee. Bannon faces a mandatory minimum prison sentence of 30 days and up to two years behind bars, though the Justice Department is recommending six months in prison and a $200,000 fine. We have team coverage of today's sentencing with NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delanian and NBC News Legal Analyst Danny Savalas. Good morning to both of you. 
All right, so Ken, we're going to start with you here. Uh, Bannon's lawyers are arguing he should only get probation. So what's their argument and how likely is it that he'll avoid jail time? Good morning, Lindsay. It's not likely at all, since, as you said, the law requires uh, at least 30 days in jail on this charge. Bannon's lawyers are arguing that that part of the law is unconstitutional. They're also arguing that the prosecution was selective uh, and political arguments they made and were rejected uh, during the trial. So it's very likely, almost certain, that Bannon will be uh, will receive some term of incarceration. Uh, his lawyers also, though, have asked that if he is sentenced to jail, that that be, sentence be served in a halfway house. It would, of course, be up to the Bureau of Prisons to decide where Bannon goes. And look, the prosecutors have really asked the judge to throw the book at Bannon. They asked for the maximum under U.S. sentencing guidelines, six months in prison and a $200,000 fine. And the fine, they went to the max on the fine because they said that Steve Bannon refused to turn over any financial information in the pre-sentencing investigation as required. He just said, no thanks, you can find me the maximum and I'll pay it. And so the prosecution said, okay, judge, let's give him the max. And Danny, I want to bring you in here also because we know Bannon's lawyers are also asking that he remain free until they appeal the sentence. So how soon could we see this appeal and why this approach? This is exactly what I would expect in Bannon's case. You can ask the court to stay a sentence, but there are very strict guidelines for that. And Bannon may meet those. Number one, he's going to have a very short sentence compared to what federal sentences normally are. And second, he has a real issue for appeal. And that's not just me saying that. That's from the trial transcript of the judge in his case expressing doubt that the case law that required him to dismiss the advice of attorney defense uh, was still good law. So if even the trial judge is in doubt about the law that he had to exclude the whole advice of attorney defense, he probably has a shot on appeal, at least a decent shot. And that's one of the standards for staying your sentence. The idea is that if you sentence someone to like two months mm. and then later on that sentence is that convictions overturned, well, there, you can't fix anything. He's already served his sentence. So that's why that law exists. I've used it myself, not with much success, but Bannon is one of those defendants that might actually prevail and be able to stay out pending appeal. Mm. Danny, when we talk about what prosecutors are saying about this, they filed this 24-page sentencing memo, and they said that Bannon's refusal to comply with the subpoena is sustained bad faith contempt of Congress. So if it's so blistering, why only push for the six months? Because they're trying to at least be reasonable. The government needs to be reasonable in asking for sentencing. And keep in mind, we have to report the statutory maximum sentence because it's the only knowable number as you go into sentencing. But the reality is Bannon is not a prior convicted felon. He's going to be on the low end of the guidelines. He's well into his 60s. The data shows that people that age are very unlikely to recidivate. In other words, do bad things again, commit future crimes. So right off the bat, Bannon is going to be on the low end of the sentencing guidelines. So the government here is being reasonable. Now, I'm a jaded defense attorney. Sometimes I feel like the government is not reasonable. But in this case, they're not trying to necessarily max him out. Uh, and that would also require consecutive sentencing. I mean, it's just not appropriate for this situation. I do think that if Bannon's argument is successful, that the statute does not require at least a month mandatory minimum, that he could get probation. By the way, the argument that he's making for this is that in the statute, it says that this crime is punishable by essentially a minimum of one month. And he's arguing that punishable doesn't mean that the court has to. It means it's Punishable, not required to be punished. It doesn't have to happen. Punishable, right. Yeah, that's the theory. We'll see if it works. Okay, well, we know you'll both keep us posted. Ken Delaney and Danny Savalos, thank you so much. A New York civil jury has cleared Kevin Spacey in his sexual abuse trial brought on by actor Anthony Rapp. Spacey left court yesterday without making any comments after the verdict was read. The jury deliberated for just over an hour, ultimately deciding Spacey was not liable in the civil sexual assault and battery case dating back to the 1980s. Rapp first made the allegations during the early days of the Me Too movement, claiming Spacey forced himself on him at a party in New York when Rapp was just 14 years old. Spacey denied the allegations. The trial lasted three weeks. Rapp has been, had been seeking rather $40 million in damages. Spacey still faces charges for a different sexual assault case in the United Kingdom. He has pleaded not guilty and is expected to go on trial there in June.
And now to the latest on the war in Ukraine, where ordinary people are now living under nuclear threat. It's hard to imagine, but children are doing drills at school, so they're prepared in the event Russia resorts to nuclear warfare. NBC News correspondent Cal Perry has the story. A lesson no child should have to learn, how to survive a nuclear explosion. The teacher tries to make it a game for these eight and nine-year-olds, and Adam was walking with an Adam, she says. The two became friends as the children act out the parts. And while the fight at the front may require bulletproof vests, here at home, swim caps and goggles will have to do. A quick dash outside and down to the bunker they go. I ask nine-year-old Maxim for a quick explanation on what's happening. You have to be very careful, Maxim tells me, and pay attention to the air alarm and run to the shelter. We also have the rule of two walls so that there's no windows, so the debris from the windows will not fall on us, he tells me. This war does not just affect the children, though these kids put on a tough face and tell me they're not scared. Is this, is it scary? So-so. Little bit. The teachers, the parents, they see it differently. They want to be brave. They want to show that they are brave, courageous. But they are scared. Everybody's scared. Tatiana Lasana is picking up her six-year-old son. And like so many here, she's already lived the unthinkable. When your son is asking me, Mom, why are they shooting to us? I don't want to die. And we're sitting in a shelter. And he's looking at me and saying that I don't want to tell him, I want to leave. Believe me, that's, that's incredibly hard to, um, to stay calm. A quick swing past the schoolyard, and I ask young Vika to play reporter. Go ahead. There is a war here, she reports in a serious manner. Our armed forces will make sure that everything ends, she says. Cal Perry, NBC News, Key. Now let's get a check at your weather this morning with some parts of the country seeing powerful storms. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us this morning. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning to you both. Happy Friday. And yeah, we're seeing a storm system moving into the northwest. That's going to be our next country's uh, weather makers. We head throughout the weekend into early next week. The northwest is first. And we're going to see that strong cold front moving inland today. So we're going to see the rain picking up. It's going to be widespread. Also some mountain snow. We could see up to a foot of snow in the highest elevations of the mountain. So that cold front will move to the south and east as it goes throughout tomorrow. It's going to plummet temperatures too, 30 degrees compared to just a day or two of go two ago. And more rain and snow from Washington to Colorado over to Montana into Wyoming as well. We could see some rain also in northern California and northern Nevada. This is your snowfall forecast throughout the northwest and the Intermountain West. We're looking at anywhere from three to six inches in the lower elevation, but could see up to eight inches, even a foot in the highest elevations of the mountain ranges there. And in the lower elevations, we're seeing some rainfall. So where you see the uh, brighter colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, especially along the coast of Washington and Oregon into the Intermountain West, we are looking at anywhere from one to even three inches of rain. That could cause some quick flooding in some of the burn areas there. Now, speaking of burn areas and also fire danger, out ahead of this front, it is warm, it is dry, and it is windy. So we're looking at fire danger today, 14 million people impacted. Where you see the red, that is a red flag warning. So that includes portions of the Intermountain West into the central and southern plains. And that's what we're going to be watching very closely as we head throughout the day. Some of that, in, especially in Wyoming, at critical fire risk levels. Otherwise, it's really warm in the middle of the country. We're looking at temperatures in the 80s. 86 in Oklahoma City, 89 in Dallas today, 86 in San Antonio. Uh, we were so chilly there a couple days ago. We've really warmed up. We're going to keep it warm as we head throughout the weekend. So weekend warm-up temperatures into the 80s today, 86, 84 degrees in Kansas City, 75 in Waterloo. That's 15 degrees above normal for this time of year. And you guys, this will head to the east as we head throughout the weekend. So really beautiful weekend to start out in portions of the northeast. Back to you. Like the sound of a beautiful weekend, Michelle Grossman. Thank you. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.